بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحبت في الله continuing on in our study of Buluga Maram the book of marriage we reach the eight hundred and thirty first hadith the hadith in Sahih Muslim Muslim reported from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked a man who had intended to marry a woman have you looked at her he replied no he said go and look at her in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala in which a man uh, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam or a man was asked by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who intended to marry a woman if he had seen her so this was initiated by the Prophet according to this hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam actually asked this man did you see her okay that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked him and so he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said have you looked at her? And then the man replied, No. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered him, Go and look at her. Adhab, fandur ilayha. So the Prophet ﷺ said this in the imperative form, meaning that in the command form. And as we know, that in general, in the uh, Sharia from the Usul, is that whenever we have a command in the Quran or a command in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the asl of that command or the the main ruling related to that command is that it's an obligation so the scholars of uh, fiqh they say al-amr yufid al-wujub or the scholars of uh, Usul, al emr you feed al wujub. A command uh, shows that something is an obligation, and the opposite of that is a nahi, you feed a tahrim. That when there is a prohibition from the speech of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, or from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that shows that that is prohibited. A prohibition means that something is haram, that it is prohibited, unless there's other text to show that it is disliked or one of the other ahkam, one of the other rulings from amongst the uh, five uh, rulings from being, and those five rulings being wajib, mandub, or mustahab, uh, or being uh, mubah, or being disliked, kiraha, or being uh, haram. So those are the five ahkam, ahkam al khamsa, with regards to usul or usul of fiqh. So, in this hadith, the Prophet wasallam commanded uh, this Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala to go and look at the woman who he intended to marry because he was ready to marry her without having looked at her and we already talked about when we discussed the, the prior hadith about some of the problems that result from some of the mufasid some of the negative uh, problems that can arise and often does arise when someone does not look uh, take a good look at the person that they wish to marry and from experience we've seen countless cases uh, of this scenario and especially in uh, unfortunately in Muslim society especially the more conservative the societies because when 
the people withdraw or restrain something from the sunnah of the Prophet because the Prophet commanded him to look but when the people in their customs say no you can't look at the woman no you can only see such and such you can only see her hands or you have to be far from her or whatever the case may be some uh, cultures they even do not allow seeing the woman's face and in fact some of the even smaller subcultures within those countries do not even uh, perhaps believe it permissible and they do not practice this some of the Bedouins do not even practice seeing their own wives faces and this is a type of extremeness this is extreme without doubt and this is against the sunnah of the Prophet because the Prophet said to see her so that does not mean it is Muharram if you don't see her as some of the scholars state letting us know that there are two views with regards to this some of the scholars say from this hadith in the hadith we studied prior to this that the that it is actually mustahab that it is recommended to see the woman so that it is uh, you know something we're recommended to to do because of of course the benefit from it and the prophet sallallahu commanded it was in the command form some say no that it's actually actually an obligation and they are going basing their view upon the fact that this was the imperative form where the prophet sallallahu made a command and so we see the two different views but it shows us in general that what we can't what we do know it is from the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu to see the woman before marriage to actually see her uh, if you are able to do so if it is difficult then you can also have a wakala you can have someone from her family that is trustworthy uh, that is able to see her to describe for you or you can make a wakala you can make uh, an agent on your behalf from your women folk so to speak from your mother from your sisters to go see her and describe uh, her for you uh, to you uh, what I will say in accordance with a lot of our cultures and in contemporary times that mo uh, more often than not this is not sufficient for many of us in our cultures so again these are uh, according to the cultural practices and for example in the West that this practice most of the people would not accept this because we have a uh, a society that's very open where you're used to seeing people you're used to seeing the opposite sex it's glorified for you in every form in the magazines in the television in the internet and people have been exposed to so much and unfortunately so much sure so many evil things as well and with that being the case there are it becomes very problematic when people get a far away from the sunnah and do not see the woman that this will more than likely cause many problems in the marriage and in, in the, end up in separation and divorce likewise what we spoke about in the last hadith which is also applicable here is that the women should not be extravagant when some a suitor is coming to see her because this also is something problematic as well is that sometimes the women they put on so much makeup and as we know today that uh, the women can do wonders with the makeup to where it is it doesn't even appear to be them at all and this is becomes very problematic if a man marries a woman and he thinks that she looks a certain way and then he becomes disappointed the first night of marriage and this is a very dangerous uh, practice so we have to be very careful uh, to not fall into these practices but rather suffice ourselves with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, practice uh, as the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam advised us to practice in the next hadith narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said no one of you should ask a woman in marriage when his brother has done so already 
until the one who is proposed to her before him gives her up or gives him permission. Mutafqun alayhi. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, this hadith shows us the impermissibility of making a khitbah or to try to get engaged to someone who is already engaged. That these are practices from the times of Jahiliya and these are practices which spread evil in the society and they spread hatred between the brotherhood. For example, if a person, uh, for example, a woman, she sometimes, uh, in many of the societies, women are working, they're out in the workplace. Sometimes a woman sees a, uh, a man, I mean a, a man sees a woman, and he wants to uh, get married to her. And so he actually proposes, or he hints, or what have you. And then she in turn lets him know that she is already engaged but there may be no apparent signs. And if this individual goes on to continually to pursue this woman, then this is muharram. This is falling in under this hadith, which the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this fact. So this is an example that if the man were to continue and not back off and say, okay, I'm sorry, uh, but to say, well, you know, I have more money than him. I can offer you much more than him. I can give you a happy life or I'm like such and such or whatever my status is such and such whatever the case may be that this is Muharram this is Muharram and why one of the th the reasons the illa is that it will cause hatred between the Islamic Brotherhood so let's look at some of the benefits of this hadith the first benefit being what I just mentioned is that it shows us this hadith is uh, shows us a hars a shari that this hadith illustrates for us that the Sharia and that uh, uh, that the Sharia encourages and is very uh, very uh, that the, that this is a, a, a very important part of the Sharia and that it encourages brotherhood in Islam. And the way we see that in that hadith was the example I, I gave you in which that if a man were to propose and his brother had already proposed to the woman, then this uh, would cause without doubt enmity and hatred because the fact that someone has uh, proposed to a woman in marriage is a very serious thing. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that that is one of the things that there's no joking allowed in that matter. And that is in, uh, you know, in uh, marriage and divorce. So letting us know the seriousness of the matter. And that if someone is put themselves out there, meaning that they have put their honor out there or they have uh, even put their heart out there in a sense, by trying to get engaged to a woman that they're engaged to her and then someone comes behind him and offers himself offers to marry her then this can without doubt more than likely 90 something percent of the time this is going to cause enmity and hatred and this is the opposite of the Islamic Brotherhood and this goes against the Islamic Brotherhood and it breaks the Islamic Brotherhood. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَكُنُّ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا And be brothers, O servants of Allah. And he mentioned in that same hadith, وَلَا تَبَاغْدُوا وَلَا تَجَاسِسُوا وَلَا تَبَاغْلُوا وَلَا تَدَابُرُوا وَلَا تَنَاجِشُوا The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, don't turn your backs on one another. Don't have enmity towards one another. Don't have hatred for one another. So Islam encourages that brotherhood, and it's prohibited to break that brotherhood. And it's imperative that we maintain the brotherhood. And the Prophet ﷺ said at the last part of the hadith, وَكُنُّوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا And be brothers, O slaves of Allah. So he commanded us to be brothers. He prohibited us from hate, causing hatred and enmity between one another and turning our backs towards one another. And one of the ways that we can actually fall into that is by going against this hadith and 
proposing to a woman who's already been proposed to uh, in marriage. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us or shows us that it is tahrim or impermissible and haram to uh, attempt to marry, uh, to, to propose when your brother has made a proposal. And this is uh, taken from the statement of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, La yakhtub. He said, and do not propose. And this shows that this is a nahi. And as we mentioned, uh, the asul wa asl fi nahi tahrim that the origin of a prohibition is that it is it means it's muharram as we mentioned and as we uh, and so this right here this statement of the prophet alayhi salatu salam affirms for us that this is a prohibited action that we can that uh, someone cannot do this one issue that arises uh, from this is is it permissible for a woman to after she has heard that her sister has been proposed to can she offer herself to marriage to that same man so the scholars differ over this mas'ala. So it shows us the intricacy of fiqh. Uh, and in regards to this, the scholars have two state, uh, two different uh, views. One of the views is that this is not permissible. And for the same reason as it, uh, for, for the men making qiyas on that mas'ala, that this is impermissible, that this will cause hatred and enmity between the uh, Muslim sisters and break the sisterhood. The other view is that it is permissible for a woman to do this uh, and this is because there's a difference between men and women in regards to a man can have more than one wife where a woman can only have one husband. So in this scenario it would be possible if the man has the uh, the ability financially and physically to be able to marry both of them then this is actually something that is permissible so this issue just for the sake of us gaining some insight into it we see the different uh, statements of the scholars with regards to that another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows us the ultimate uh, importance of the of maintaining that Islamic brotherhood and the love that is between uh, Muslims and that takes precedence over, of course, our shahwar desires and our own personal uh, inclinations. So the Islamic Brotherhood is very important and avoiding those things which cause harm and are a detriment to that brothers, brotherhood is, uh, is something which is, uh, you know, an obligation upon a Muslim to do. In the next hadith, narrated Sahal ibn Sa'ad al Sa'adi al Sa'adi radiallahu ta'ala an. A woman came to Allah's Messenger وسلم, and said, <clears throat> O Allah's Messenger, I came to offer myself to you in marriage. Allah's Messenger وسلم, looked her up and down carefully. And then Allah's Messenger وسلم, lowered his head. When the woman saw that he had not made any decision regarding her, she sat down. A man of his companions then stood up and said, O Allah's Messenger, if you have no need for her, marry her to me. He asked, Do you have anything to give her as a dowry? 
He replied, No. I swear by Allah, O Allah's Messenger. He thereupon said, Go to your family and see if you can find something. He went and then returned and said, No, I swear by Allah, I found nothing. Allah's Messenger وسلم, then said, Look for something, even if it should be an iron ring. He went and then returned and said, No, I swear by by Allah, O Allah's Messenger, not even an iron ring, but I have only this lower garment of mine. Saha said, he had no upper garment, and I shall give her half of it. Allah's Messenger وسلم, then said, what will she do with your lower garment? For if you wear it, there would be nothing of it on her, and if she wears it, there would be nothing of it on you. The man then sat down. And when he had sat for a long time, he stood up and Allah's Messenger وسلم, saw him departing. So he commanded him and he was called back. When he came back, he said, what do you have? Meaning, what have you memorized from the Quran? He replied, I have surah such and such and surah such and such. He counted them. He then asked, can you recite them by heart? He replied, yes. He said, Go, for I have given her to you in marriage for the part of the Qur'an which you know. And this is Mutafiqun Ade, and the wording is Muslims. Another narration has, Go, for I have given her to you in marriage, so teach her some of the Qur'an. And narration by Al-Bukhari has, I have married her to you for the part of the Qur'an which you know. Abu Dawood has a narration, from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he asked, what have you memorized? He replied, Surah Al-Baqarah, and the one that follows it. He then said, get up and teach her 20 verses. In this hadith, there are many, uh, many benefits. From amongst those benefits of this hadith is first, is it shows us that it is permissible to speak about something in a general way if there is no benefit in speaking about it specifically, meaning mentioning specific names. And this is a benefit, and it's derived from the statement in the Hadith where the Prophet said, uh, where, where it was narrated, that uh, uh, in the hadith Ja'at Imra'a that a woman came meaning a woman came uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu it was not mentioned specifically the name of this woman so in this situation there was no real benefit that we would derive from hearing this sunnah uh, hearing this hadith from knowing specifically this woman's name. So there was no benefit of knowing specifically who this woman's name in order for us to gain the lessons of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was no necessity. So sometimes it is beneficial not to mention specific names or specific individuals, sometimes even when it comes to refuting uh, an ideology which is foreign to Islam that it is not always necessary to mention specifically the individual who made the mistake or the individual who even did the bid'ah if this person's bid'ah uh, is not widespread and if there is no need to mention them. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it was permissible for a woman to give herself in marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without a mahar, without any uh, dowry, uh, dowry. And that was evident from this hadith. However, what's very important is to know that other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we have to give a mahar. And there are four different situations with regards to this. One particular situation with regards to the mahar is that a man marries a woman 
with a specific mahar. And this is well known, this is what usually takes place, is for example, a man, uh, before they marry, they ask, what, what would you like for your mahar? You know, she's very clear, she says, I want a thousand dollars, I want ten thousand dollars, I want so many dirhams, or whatever the case may be. She wants a specific dowry, and that's well known. So the man agrees to that, and they get married, and during the, and, and they get married. The second scenario is that a man marries her with a specific mahar, but this mahar is unknown. And so, for example, uh, if it were to be, for example, the man had a certain amount of wealth in his pocket, or something like this, which he didn't know how much, and he says, I, I marry you, or she says, she says to him, I'll marry you for whatever you have on your persons. And he pulls out such and such money. That means this is specific money, but it was unknown at the time when they uh, began the marital contract. So also, although there's some uh, jahl or some ignorance to the amount or the amount is unknown that this as uh, the uh, Sheikh Ben Othaymin mentions is, a, is permissible still because the marital contract is not exactly like the, uh, the business contract. Uh, another, the third scenario per, pertaining to the mahar in this situation is to marry the woman and then be silent. For example, the wali or the guardian says, I've married my daughter or married my uh, this woman to you and, he, and, and then he's silent and he doesn't mention a specific in, in, any mahar. So the scholars agree that this is permissible and that in this scenario there, that doesn't mean there's no mahar but the mahar will be similar to the women of her custom or in her community or the people in her family what her maybe her mother and her sisters got or maybe her tribe or whatever the case may be it will go to the to the uh, to the custom to the custom of that people or of her friends or of her society or what have you the fourth scenario is that she marries the man or the marry, the man marries her and that the man makes it a condition he says hey I, I don't have the uh, a mahar and I, I don't want to pay a mahar okay uh, the scholars also have two and then she agrees to that or uh, yeah so he makes that a condition so there are two statements with regards to this issue the first statement is that this this marriage is not uh, sahih, it's greater sahih. This is not permissible to do this. And this is the view of Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Also, Ben Uthaymin supports this view. The other view is that the uh, nikah is sahih, that it's a sound marriage, and that even though he made this condition, still. Uh, that he is will be required to pay a mahar he cannot make this stipulation he will still be required to pay a mahar and it will be according to the custom going to the custom and the next benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is also its evidence for the permissibility for the one who wants to get engaged to a woman that he can see the woman he is uh, he wishes to get engaged with and the prophet sallallahu said fasa'ad fasa'ada fiha another so strive to 
uh, to see her. You know, letting us know that it is permissible to see her. And also another benefit from this hadith and from this statement is it shows that, that it is permissible to take more than one look. And this goes back also uh, under the conditions that, of course, that the person is not doing it just to uh, out of their desires and to build up their, their desires and so forth. But there's an actual need to. They want to get a better view uh, of her to make sure that she is pleasing to him. And likewise, for her to see him, to see that he is pleasing to her. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows the husna khulq of the Prophet Sallallahu The good manners of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is the case that, in, in and this is evidence when the Prophet Sallallahu was asked, uh, the woman proposed to the Prophet Sallallahu he may not have been pleased with her. But he didn't just say no, 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 or something like this, but he actually just lowered his gaze and his head uh, to illustrate that he was not really interested. And this was from his shyness and from his good mannerisms. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith also shows us the good manners of this woman that she didn't push the issue and become angry but rather she just sat down so this shows the good manners of this sahabi uh, sahabia also this hadith illustrates for us the good manners of the sahaba in general and this is illustrated from the statement of the man he said oh messenger of Allah if you don't have any need for her, then please marry her to me. So he did this in a very polite way. And he was illustrating that he wanted to, uh, showing that he, you know, he had a need to, to marry. He wanted to marry. And he did this with good manners and without forcefulness. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, also shows... That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam For him Salawatu Rabbi Wasallam That there was many exceptions for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And one of them was that he married without a wali That he was able to marry without a wali Which for other men in the Ummah This is not permissible, you must have a wali As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said La nika illa bi wali that there is no marriage without the guardian. Another benefit of this hadith uh, is that the Prophet ﷺ could have married the woman even while without, without a wali and without returning to the wali, of course. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us the permissibility of marrying with a small uh, amount for a mahar, meaning that a mahar does not have to be outrageous. And this is a, a big problem in many of the societies. So we have to quickly uh, make ishara or point this out that unfortunately, especially in the Muslim lands because of the traditional cultures, in many of the cultures, the men cannot afford to marry. They have to take bank loans. They have to loan from their tribe, especially in the Arab world. And I'm sure the same is in Pakistan, and I'm sure the same is in Afghanistan, and many of the other countries, and probably some of the African countries as well, that they have these di great difficulties that they place on the men because the women want such extravagant mahars. And this puts a great burden upon the men and makes it so people are unable to marry in the society and this, uh, then it spreads facade. Because if you can't have the halal, you're going to incline towards the haram. And I see this every single day. I have, in the society that I live in, uh, a Muslim society, because of their mahar is so high, the, the, the young youth, they even brag about the haram activities they do of traveling to the neighboring country and going to the bars and being with the women 
Akramakumullah, and likewise, unfortunately, Akramakumullah, the widespread uh, 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 masturbation. So these are problems that result with, when it comes to a difficulty of raising, uh, of, of obtaining a mahar. And this is because the societies make it so difficult to marry either the woman herself or the family or the tribe. They say, oh, it's from our honor. You can't marry a woman from our tribe without such and such amount of money. Likewise, some parents even take the mahar or take some of the mahar from the, the daughter, which is impermissible. And then there's the situation where some of the women are just, they just want a lot of money. And it's almost as if they're selling themselves. They just think whatever they think about these things. And these are all ca cause calamities in our societies. Wallahu musta'an. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows the wisdom of the Prophet والسلام, in dealing with his Sahaba, in his Hikmah. And that he said, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Idhab, Idhab ila ahlika, Fandr hal tajid shay. The Prophet Sallallahu from his wisdom, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted the man to make sure that his family didn't have something to perhaps assist him with as a mahar, uh, to assist him with the mahar. So he said, go to your family and see if they have anything. And so this was from the hikmah of the Prophet والسلام, in trying to find ways to, uh, to deal with the issues at hand. Another benefit of this hadith is this shows us the complete uh, manners, the excellent manners of the Sahaba radiallahu with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that the man was humble and accepting the advice and went, went immediately uh, on the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam instead of like us a lot of times we'll argue, we'll hesitate, we'll say well you know, you know we'll make excuses, we'll Allah understand. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us the permissibility of wearing a ring, uh, uh, an iron ring. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that is an obligation, of course, to uh, cover the body, but that it is not obligatory. This hadith illustrates it is not obligatory for the person who is unable to, to cover their upper body, meaning the man, to cover his upper body. And it also shows that all the Sahaba, that some of the Sahaba were very, very poor, extremely poor. Poor and humble. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows us that, uh, that a person, it is not permissible for a person to give something that they absolutely need to practice their religion or to fulfill their family's needs or their own stomachs uh, to someone else. So at your own expense you should not deprive yourself in order to give someone else. If this is, we're talking about a deprive, depriving yourself of a necessity. This hadith illustrates for us and this was the case uh, this was, uh, we find this evidence in that the Prophet وسلم, said to the Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala an, that you should not give, uh, if you give from your garment, then you will have nothing to wear. You will not be able to clothe yourself uh, what you need in the way that which you need to clothe yourself. So this is evidence that something that you need, absolutely, that you should not uh, give it to someone else. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us the importance of patience. Also this hadith shows us the permissibility of making a mahar something beneficial. And in this case it was the Quran. It was what this man knew of the Quran. This also, this hadith shows us the permissibility of accepting uh, a 
uh, some some money for teaching the Quran that this is permissible and this is one of the evidence for that also this hadith shows us that it is permissible to work for teaching the Quran and being rewarded so in the case the first scenario if someone offers you something for it the second scenario that you have actually have this as your job that you are actually asking for a wage for this that this is also permissible because this is a type of work as well and this hadith is evidence for that a last benefit of this hadith and of course there are many is that this hadith also shows that it is an obligation for the man to uh, pay uh, a mahar that he uh, should pay a mahar and the only situation which really uh, because this is the right of the woman if she says no you don't have to give me a mahar for example if they've agreed upon a mahar or whatever the situation and then she decides I don't I don't want a mahar I don't need a mahar from you you know we are bond whatever the situation is that she has that right likewise she also which is another mess coming from this another issue which comes from this and is that a woman also has a right to if she wishes to uh, say that she does not want nafaka that she does not want to be cared for some women are wealthy some women are you know they work or whatever the case may be and they may not be in need of that support so it is their right if they choose to to say that they do not want a nafaka and those are just some of the benefits of this hadith in the 834th hadith narrated Amr ibn Abdullah ibn Zubair on the authority of his father Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said make marriage publicly known reported by Ahmed and Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih or authentic <clears throat> in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it shows the importance that a part of the matrimony ceremony <clears throat> or after it uh, is the announcement and that it's essential to avoid uh, the disgrace and unnecessary criticism of people and for many other reasons there are many forms of this announcement witnesses at the time of the matrimonial rites are also a form of announcement to announce in the assembly of people is another form. It can also be announced by playing a duff, a small tambourine, uh, but of course musical band or fireworks or things which are following the way of the disbelieving nations is impermissible. As the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam said, Men Tishabba be common for women whom whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Let that you would follow the way of those who came before you. <clears throat> so this hadith shows us that it is important to make Ilan or to announce the uh, the marriage the marital uh, ceremony or to the marital bond. And as was mentioned, one of the reasons is to keep from the shubahat or the doubtfulness to come into people's heart about, for example, are the people married or not? If all of a sudden they see uh, individual, individuals together and they didn't know they were even married, uh, this can be a shock and sometimes even be a dangerous uh, situation in certain communities. As we know that some of the communities, unfortunately, due to a type of backwardness that they practice honor killings uh, in many of the tribal societies and these kind of things due to these practices these jahiliya practices uh, that if someone were not to announce and it was not known that 
two individuals got married, then of course we can see the most the the dangerous repercussions of a lack of announcing that marital bond for the community, the tribe, for others uh, and other family members even. Sheikh Ben Othaymin mentioned some great benefits uh, of the uh, announcing uh, the, mar the marriage. He said first, by announcing the marriage, it makes a, it distinguishes the difference between the Islamic bond, which is through marriage and nikah, and the ways of, uh, of zina and adultery. And so this, uh, by announcing the nikah, this shows that you have, uh, that you, you have, you're practicing the Islamic bond of marriage. You know, Islamic matrimony, which is something which has great status, which is pleasing to Allah, which has the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if the person, the people who practice zina and adultery, of course, and having boyfriends and girlfriends, then they have lessened their own stature, especially in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the sight of the Muslim community. Another benefit of i'lan or uh, announcing the marital bond is that this shows uh, this exalts that natural Sharia practice which is the bond of marriage the bond of matrimony and in fact all the faiths predominantly all the major world religions and all those even if they deviated from the path of the prophets alayhim afdal salatu wassalam all those that that were uh, a part of the original islamic community the original muslim community meaning the the minhaj and the way of the nba of the the prophets alayhim afdal salatu wassalam judaism and christianity they exalt the marital bond and even you'll find many of the Mushrikeen, their practices is that they practice uh, marriage. The Hindus, the Sikhs, and other groups, they even look to that marital bond as something, as something esteemed, as something which is good. So Islam uh, not only encourages, it, it commands this uh, to prevent from the lower status which is uh, achieved when someone commits adultery and zina. Uh, another benefit of making i'lan or making the announcement of uh, marriage is that it also encourages others to get married. Meaning that if it becomes widespread in a community, uh, zina, then it begins to, in the eyes of people, uh, it, um, in the eyes of the people, it becomes normalized. Uh, and for example, that even you'll find in many Muslim societies, unfortunately, because of their moving away from the Sharia practices and, and basically having Sharia in only some of their laws, sometimes very limited laws, and, and so forth, that due to this, that you find that even in some of the Muslim countries, or many of the Muslim countries, I should say, that there is uh, an ex there is even allowance for uh, boyfriend and girlfriend to, to happen for people to have relations. It becomes like it's not even a big deal anymore. You know, uh, they may discourage generally having children out of wedlock. I don't think that is widespread in the Muslim lands that it is out there, and Allah knows best in most of the Muslim lands, anyhow. But however, the acceptance of having a boyfriend or having a girlfriend has become normalized in many of the societies and then when it becomes normalized then obviously others look to that and they think that this is the norm so when you practice the nikah the marital bond that Islam is legislated and you make i'lan 
you make the announcement of this marital bond, you are following the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and you are inviting people to that sunnah. People see that as the norm. For example, in the more conservative Muslim countries, in, in many of the Arab countries, they don't tend to be as, and probably even in, in, in Pakistan and, and uh, Afghanistan and some of the other societies that are very conservative and less uh, liberal and open, that they tend to, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, uh, not allow this, this bond to be widespread. So it's still very strong, the marital bond, and, and is shunned to uh, commit zina and be outside the marital bond. So uh, what's normalized is the nikah. It's expected. People uh, generally wait for it and so forth and then this becomes uh, when it what's normalized the sunnah is normalized then those who follow you will take that normalized practice bi'idnillah so you're setting an example by making atlan by making the pronouncement of the marital the nikah then you are establishing that precedence and uh, for people others to follow another <coughs> benefit of this announcement of the nikah is that when people uh, when they uh, announce the nikah then it also helps to prevent the situation in which people end up getting married that are in fact have some sort of uh, some sort of relationship between them meaning some sort of familiar bond, a, a bond through, for example, rida, through uh, breastfeeding, that they could be, have been suckled from the same woman. One could be her biological child, the other one not, but through the, uh, the suckling, you know, for the child having been breastfed uh, numerous times, then they, they have now a type of bond which uh, prevents them from being married. So this uh, situation uh, is partially prevented by this i'lan, by making the announcement of the nikah. In the next hadith, the hadith uh, narrated Abu Burda bin Abu Musa on the authority of his father Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said there is no marriage without a guardian the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la nikah illa bi wali Ahmed and al-Arba reported it Ibn al-Madani uh, al-Tirmidhi and Ibn Hibban graded it as sahih or authentic but it was regarded defective uh, for being mursal meaning a missing missing a link after the tabi'i. Uh, Imam Ahmed reported from Al-Hassan from Imran ibn uh, Hussein as marfu' meaning that it was attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that th this uh, narration, there is no marriage without a guardian and two witnesses. La nikah illa bi wali wa shahidain. In this hadith, Of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, "La nikah illa bi wali." There is no marriage without the guardian. Uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said this, it lets us know because it is as we've mentioned prior to this, when we hear a prohibition or a nafi, he said, "La nikah." And here, this is referring to that there is la nikah, or no marriage that is an authentic marriage, or an acceptable, an Islamically acceptable marriage. Not meaning that you didn't do it, but it means that it, it wasn't done properly, meaning it is not acceptable according to the shara. So this lets us know that there must have a, 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 a sound 
marriage, an Islamic marriage, that one must have a wali, must, one must have a guardian. So from this hadith, there are several benefits. One of the benefits is that it is in order to have a sound nikah, you must have a wali. Meaning that without a wali, without a guardian, there is no sound uh, nikah. The nikah is not uh, uh, considered acceptable in the sh sharia, that they're not married. Uh, so that lets us know that is one of the conditions for nikah, is a wali. One of the conditions for nikah, or marriage, is that there is a guardian. Uh, and this is in accordance to majority of the ulama, although there is a, a view counter to this with the Ahnaf, the, uh, uh, the Hanafiya, that uh, counter this uh, with regards to a woman who has been married before, as there's a hadith which we will discuss uh, later, and they use that as evidence to say, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, to paraphrase the hadith, that the woman who has been married before, that she has more right to her own, uh, to make her own decision about marriage. So the Hanafiya, they take this and use this hadith as evidence to say that the woman does not require, uh, this woman does not require uh, uh, a guardian. But the most of the ulama concur that uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, La nikah illa bi wali, that there is no marriage without the guardian. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows us that the wali or the guardian must be a guardian that has that is able to offer the woman guidance. It's not just a role that someone has jumped into and they have no concern for the woman and they have no no insight and no wisdom to look into, to be able to uh, help and assist the woman with her affairs. It's not just plugging in a position or a role, but rather the wali should have uh, should have rushed. He should be a person of guidance to be able to help guide and show and look for the benefit of the woman that he is a guardian for. Then this shows that he is uh, out for the maslaha or the benefit of the woman. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the wali or the guardian should be someone who uh, is able, of course, to be a guardian, that they fit the criterion for being a guardian. And one of the things, of course, which negates that is if the, alleged, the person who's going to fulfill the position of a guardian is a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim cannot fulfill the guardianship of a Muslim woman. So for example, if her father is a non-Muslim, she became Muslim or whatever the case may be, but he is a non-Muslim, he cannot be her guardian. That doesn't mean we disrespect him, that doesn't mean uh, that we belittle him or belittle his role as her father, as her father and father figure, but shar'an, as an Islamic practice, he cannot give her away as the guardian in the nikah. He is not the uh, legitimate authority in this situation. That the guardian must be uh, a Muslim who is, of course, balugh, you know, that's mature, uh, and that has rushed, as we mentioned, that is able to look out for her affairs. And this could be either from, of course, first and foremost, from her father, but if it's the father or the, the grandfather or the the uncle or someone like this is not in place, they are not Muslim, then this guardianship would be uh, given to the Imam.
those are just some of the main uh, or in the second hadith we want to mention this hadith as well la nika illa bi wali wa shahidain the Prophet Sallallahu said that there is and this was the hadith which is attributed marfu' uh, on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the last hadith we mentioned uh, which is the statement of Imran uh, uh, bin Hussein who said that there is no uh, marriage except with a wali meaning the guardian and two witnesses uh, from this hadith it shows that there is uh, again as we already mentioned the necessity for a sound nikah is that there is a uh, that there is a guardian and as far as the the off the um, the shahidain then this hadith uh, has been reported by about 30 companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam some of his chain of narrators are authentic uh, the first guardian in this situation is the father as we mentioned and the grandfather then the brothers and afterwards the uncles if there is a difference of opinion among two guardians uh, whoever is nearer his opinion will be preferred and if both of them are equally near in relation as brothers and uncles then the present ruler will be the guardian and authority to decide if two guardians of equal status marry a woman separately then the first marriage will be legal and the latter will be considered invalid if the married woman agrees to one guardian and differs with the other then the opinion of the woman of course is preferred so some of the ulama they distinguish and derive from this hadith as well the necessity as a part of the conditions for nikah uh, to have two witnesses and as we mentioned prior to this uh, in the the hadith prior to this that uh, some of the scholars state and Ben Othamin also holds this view that the Atlan uh, can uh, that by making announcement for example if a guardian marries the woman and makes the you know they make the announcement that she's been married and so forth he married the woman and there was no witnesses then some of the scholars hold that this is sufficient and that this is a sound marital contract according to this uh, narration the two witnesses uh, because and and their view also is that the uh, the uh, the Atlan or the announcement of the nikah is sufficient that takes the place of having two guardians because now you've announced it to the community the other view which is in accordance with this hadith and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and some is that some of the scholars they hold firmly that you must have the guardian and the two witnesses and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم